Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are, and welcome uh, to this webinar, which I'm sure all of you would agree is something that impresses us, challenges, challenges us, and makes us want to think about uh, what the future is like when freedom of speech on Palestine is being silenced in universities that are known to be places where liberal thought should be freely discussed. There should be discourses that are challenging both you know, different viewpoints. Um, but unfortunately, that's not always the case. And so we've brought together uh, different people and the, and the moderator who can lead us through this discourse on the whole question of silencing freedom of speech on Palestine and what that implies for us today. Uh, I'm going to in leave you with our moderator, and that is Lubna Sh Somali. Um, Lubna works for an organization called Badil, which is a human rights organization, which defends and protects human rights uh, according to human rights law, humanitarian law, and refugee law. Uh, Lubna, who studied in the United States, was born in Palestine, he worked with the municipality of uh, Bethlehem and is currently head of the unit of the Badil Resource Center for Palestinian Residency Rights and Refugee Rights. So I will hand you over to Lubna. Thank you, Lubna, for accepting to do this. Thank you, Ranjan, and thank you to all our colleagues um, at uh, the Movement for Liberation on the and for putting together this, uh, this webinar, we'll be hearing from a number of uh, different individuals around the globe about how um, the speech on Palestine is being silenced. Um, a common tactic utilized in the battle for supremacy and power is the dehumanization and demonization of the other. While it's not a new or original tactic, tactic sadly, it's very effective and allows the oppressor not only to oppress the other, but if done so, but if done effectively, it allows the oppressor to control the narrative. One of the most obvious situations in which the narrative is not only being controlled, but also written uh, by the oppressor is the case of Palestine. It is a necessity for Israel, not only to suppress the people of Palestine and control their land, but also to provide a justification for this suppression and control, which entrenches and sustains uh, its colonial apartheid regime. And so while I do agree that the pen is, is mightier than the sword, the pen, like the sword, is double-edged. Israel's ability to suppress the true narrative on Palestine and dictate the terminology allows it to entrench its colonial apartheid regime, which not only impacts us as Palestinians, our resistance and our struggle for liberation, but it also impacts the freedoms of the international solidarity movement and international human rights defenders, activists, and academics, as well as organizations. The defamation, smear, and delegit delegitimization campaigns that we are experiencing, and by we, I mean Palestinian and international community-based organizations, human rights organizations, academic institutions, yeah. and individuals, advocating for Palestinian rights. The, what we are facing stems from um, Israeli government endorsed non-government organizations that aim to defame, discredit, and silence yeah. and defund the those whole table. and individuals that criticize Israel's colonial apartheid regime, their policies and practices. These government endorsed organizations function under the auspices of the former Israeli Strategic Affairs Ministry, which is now part of the Israeli Ministry of Foreign Affairs. This former Ministry of Strategic Affairs holds the responsibility to guide, coordinate, and integrate the activities of all the ministers and the government and of civil entities in Israel and abroad on the subject of the struggle against attempts to delegit delegitimize Israel and the boycott movement. These actors, they lobby governments to pass laws and develop policies to suppress both domestic and international organizations, including the refusal and withdrawal 
uh, of use of public and private facilities for Palestine related activities or events, the closure of bank accounts or obstruction of access to fundraising and or money transfer tools and cutting off funding from public or private donors. While these actors have weaponized anti-terrorism in their campaign to delegitimize Palestinian civil society, they have weaponized anti-Semitism to silence, defame, and intimidate international supporters of Palestine, including, but not limited to, uh, the academic community and academia. By labeling all international efforts to stand in solidarity with the Palestinian people and their rights as anti-Semitic, including any perceived criticism of Israel, academics, activists, and human rights defenders have faced considerable obstacles and hardships. The only acceptable narratives is one that re reiterates and regurgitates the Zionist Israeli talking points. Anything outside these talking points, including the most fundamental and basic internationally accepted legal principles and tenets of international law are rejected out of hand and then weaponized to further suppress and silence the other. Allegations of anti-Semitism in, in the case of the international community or international supporters of Palestine and terrorism in the case of Palestinians fuel the problematic approach of the international community that is based on terminology and analysis that encourages neutrality, impartiality, and the concept of a balanced approach. The conflict in Palestine, and I use this word quite hesitantly because I don't, I don't um, think that conflict is an adequate word to describe our situation in Palestine, but it is far from balanced. Further, the accurate legal descriptors for the situation in Palestine are not applied by states, regional governments, and bodies. Israeli human rights violations and international crimes are described rather using neutral language that has no legal or ethical repercussions. For example, Israeli colonization is reduced to settlements. Palestinian forcible transfer is reduced to displacement or evacuation or forced evictions. Israeli apartheid is reduced to discrimination. And this neutrality, impartiality, and balanced terminology serves to reinforce Israel's impunity, thus creating a situation where censorship and suppression is not only accepted but encouraged, particularly of those individuals and organizations who dare criticize Israel and those who call the situation in Palestine what it truly is, and that is an Israeli-sponsored is colonial apartheid regime. Today, we're going to hear from um, uh, a few different speakers on how they are facing, what these specific obstacles or how these policies are being implemented against them and how they are, um, uh, what the, their repercussions are. I do want to mention that in Badil, we are um, going to be issuing two separate um, publications on this issue. Badil uh, publishes or used to publish, and now we are revitalizing this publication, um, uh, uh, a periodical magazine called Al Majdal and Hak al Auda. Al Majdal is in English and Hak al Auda is in Arabic. And the next two issues of each magazine that are coming out are going to be analyzing and looking at the different um, uh, sectors and the different areas in which this um, oppression or suppression of the freedom of speech and this relabeling and uh, misconstruction of the situation in Palestine um, and how this is how this is affecting both the Palestinian Palestinian civil society as well as um, international civil society. Um, without further ado, uh, we're going to speak with we're going to hear our next speaker, uh, which is. Uh, Mr. Tom Hickey, and he is an honorary research fellow at the University of Brighton in the UK, and also an ex-member of the University and Colleges Union, the UCU, which is a lecturer's trade union. Um, go ahead, uh, Tom. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you, Lebanon, and thank you uh, to all of you for, for the invitation. I want to start by saying that it's quite difficult to explain to you how dramatic the changes have been that have occurred in British higher education um, over the last couple of decades. Uh, and it's impossible to go into all that detail on a, on a short Zoom call. Um, yet amongst the most dramatic uh, changes that have taken place have been the closing down of opportunities for free discussion of Palestine on British campuses, 
pressure on teachers and researchers that causes them to think twice about how to profess their views on Palestine without being labeled as anti-Semites. Uh, threats to students who want to campaign in solidarity with Palestine and have their events canceled. And threats to both staff and students for their use of social media outside lectures or the campus altogether. Uh, any activism in support of Palestine trawled through carefully by uh, people determined to find evidence uh, of anti-Semitism or other uh, actionable uh, behavior. All of this is highly coordinated, it's well-funded, uh, and these attacks are semi-professional in their nature. This situation would have been unimaginable, unimaginable even five years ago, and it would have been considered impossible 10 years ago. I want to do uh, three things this evening or this morning or wherever you happen to be on, on the globe. Um, one is to uh, just go through in, what in Britain have been the um, identifiable actors in this, the agents, as it were, of uh, the Israeli state in defense of, of, of Israel. I want to identify the nature of the targets, and then I want to address the question of the allegations that are made. And finally, I want to look at what underlies most of the incidents and, and the attacks, and that is the introduction in Britain of what is called the IHRA definition, the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance definition um, of anti-Semitism. Uh, of course, this closing down of space of Palestinian civil society, uh, of, of the capacity of civil society in Britain to discuss Palestinian issues has been going on for some time. But the intensification of it over the past period um, has been remarkable. And one of the ways, uh, and I will put up a, a quick PowerPoint uh, to share with you if this works. Um, hold on. Does that work? Yes, it works. Um, one of the ways uh, that this works is through uh, legislation, laws that are specifically introduced by states in order to make Palestine solidarity more difficult. And sometimes the application of laws that have been introduced for very good reasons, anti-racist legislation or community cohesion legislation that suddenly finds itself being used in order to silence arguments in defense of Palestine because it's claimed that this in some way attacks the Jewish communities uh, in the UK. The, the sharpest element of this has to be at the moment, the introduction by the British government of a laws that specifically designed to make it illegal for any public sector body uh, to adopt a BDS strategy, a boycott, disinvestment uh, and sanctions strategy, to make it unlawful to do that uh, and, and make anybody who, is part, who, are, who participates in a public body to adopt such a position um, liable to financial and other consequences up to and including uh, court hearings and, and imprisonment. That doesn't mean to say that the government is against boycotts and sanctions because it reserves to itself the right to impose them when it considers appropriate. What it's trying to make illegal is any boycott movement or sanctions movement that is inconsistent with government policy. So any boycott of Israel would be outlawed, but for instance, when NATO and the Western Alliance wishes to boycott or sanction Russia for its current unjustifiable uh, invasion of the Ukraine, there is no problem about them pers pursuing that. The second part of this, this, this pattern is the attempt um, to get restrictive policies used, non-legal restrictions, to get uh, universities or local authorities to use whatever regulations they have in such a way that the interpretation of the behavior of staff or of students or, or, or is considered to be in breach of those regulations. But if that's the, uh, the background to it, if that's the, uh, the approaches that, that have been taken, it's important for us, I think, to uh, be able to identify the agents of these restrictions. And these will be different in different countries. And I'm just going to speak about the ones that are identifiable here. Um, the actors in this, or the agents in, in the imposition of these restrictions on Palestinian debate um, are individuals or groups or organizations that purposely set out to target advocates of Palestinian rights, usually with the intention of inflicting harms on them of various kinds, whether that be financial harm, reputational damage, or personal harm. In other words, it's an attempt to create an atmosphere of intimidation 
in order to silence criticism of Israel and defense of Palestine and Palestinian liberation. In the case of the United Kingdom, this is centered on three different organizations. One, the Board of Deputies of British Jews, um, an organization that claims, despite the, the fact that there are a substantial minority of British Jews who are anti-Zionists, which claims to represent um, all Jews in the United Kingdom, uh, but fundamentally finds itself defending the interests of Israel. The second is the campaign against anti-Semitism, formed in 2014 specifically to defend Israel from criticism. And I'm sure that in other countries there are other organizations of this kind that have been set up specifically to do that. And finally, the Community Security Trust, an organization that, that um, uh, traces incidents of anti-Semitism and the threat to the Jewish community, but increasingly has uh, inclined to find um, threats to the Jewish community represented by defense of Palestinian rights and advocacy on behalf of Palestine. Then there are lawfare groups, groups or organizations um, that use legal means or the threat of legal means in a manner uh, in the forms of litigation, actual litigation, or filing of regulatory complaints to other bodies uh, that challenge, for instance, the charitable status of organizations that that uh, make positive remarks about Palesti the Palestinian struggle. And in some cases, these organizations exert pressure on various financial services for those services to retract any service that they are giving to groups that are operating in defense of Palestine. The most prominent of these lawfare organizations, in other words, organizations that try to use the law as a form of warfare against Palestine is the organization UK Lawyers for Israel. Um, which is uh, a semi is, is a body of professional lawyers that have come together with premises highly very well funded and have been engaged in most of the attempts to close down Palestinian solidarity work uh, across UK campuses. And then there's what we call the enablers, those organizations that aren't primary movers in all of this attempt to attack Palestine solidarity, um, but who in failing to stand up to the organizations that are primarily responsible, um, effectively allow, uh, rather than uh, initiate, they allow the silencing of Palestinian voices and Palestinian solidarity to take place. And here I'm referring particularly to local authorities, municipal authorities um, that collapse in the face of the external pressure from the lawfare organizations or the campaigning anti-Palestinian organizations. And of course, university managements that come under the similar kinds of pressure and then collapse in the face of that pressure rather than defending the academic freedom of their staff and the freedom of expression of their students. The targets here uh, of all of this um, are uh, easily identifiable. The primary targets, of course, are the advocacy groups themselves, those pro-Palestinian organizations that continually try to bring in front of the public gaze or in, the, in front of the gaze of students or staff in, a, in an institution or in a local authority amongst the, the uh, residents of a local area, uh, what is taking place in Palestine and the history of Palestine and the history of the formation and practices of the Israeli state. So the primary targets are those organizations or campaigning organizations or indeed individuals who get attacked. Then there are the secondary organizations which are the organizations within which those groups operate, uh, such as universities or local authorities or even political parties. And those of you who have ever followed anything about... Hello, can somebody mute themselves, please? Um, and if anybody follows British politics, then they've noticed the intense attack uh, on the past, the last leader of the Labour Party, Jeremy Corbyn, who is a Palestine supporter, which actually caused uh, the Labour Party to lose a general election and then caused uh, this pro-Palestinian leader of the Labour Party to get uh, deposed. The charges of anti-Semitism reduced down uh, uh, to those um, that have been re referred to already. Um, those allegations are allegations and accusations of anti-Semitism on the one hand, uh, often using the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance definition of what anti-Semitism is. And on the other hand, uh, the, um, the, uh, the argument that Palestinian supporters are in some sense supporters of terrorism. Um, there is never any evidence either of anti-Semitism in all of the cases that have been brought in the case of British universities or of support of terrorism. The argument about anti-Semitism is based simply on the argument that since Israel is the only Jewish state in the world, 
to criticize it or to question the Zionist philosophy and political position that underpins its existence, to criticize Zionism or Israel in that sense is in itself so anti-Semitic. In other words, a conflation and confusion of anti-Semitism, which is a form of racism, with political criticism and political disagreement, which is what uh, criticism of Zionism constitutes. Uh, the argument about supporting terrorism is, is just uh, ludicrous. Absolutely none of the people, none whatsoever, of those academics and students in British universities who have over the past decade uh, uh, been attacked in this way, have any record, have made any speeches in support of terrorism. I'll give you an example of, of one of these cases. We have a young Palestinian woman just finishing her PhD in Sheffield Hallam University and who was offered her first job at Sheffield Hallam as a temporary lecturer, who suddenly got attacked in this way. And when the attackers failed to get her dismissed from her job, in this case, it was people um, advised by UK lawyers for Israel, but they were Zionist students who were making the uh, attacks on her. They caused her to confront disciplinary hearings over an, and an investigation over an extended period. And the university, to its credit, found no evidence of anti-Semitism in her activism or in her behavior on the university campus, none whatsoever. So the case was dismissed and immediately uh, her attackers changed tack and now dredging through her personal history, discovered that her father 25, 30 years ago had been a member of a militant uh, um, Palestinian organization um, hadn't been involved in any military activity or terrorist activity, but because he'd been a member and supporter of that organization, she was accused of being a supporter of terrorism. That's the degree, the degeneration of what you could of what you might have described as the kind of intellectual caliber that, that we're facing. Um, but the point about all of these kinds of things is that they do lead to action uh, and action with serious consequences. We have we face. Um, hostile inflammatory allegations of anti-Semitism or supporting terrorism. We face uh, situations in which uh, Palestinian groups or students on campuses are refused the right to book rooms in order to hold meetings to discuss the Palestinian case. We face in some cases legal action directed at individuals accusing them of anti-Semitic speech, all of which get dismissed by the court. But the point about these actions, of course, are not that there is an expectation by Palestine's enemies that they will win the case. The point is to bring the case and to drag people through the courts or to drag them through disciplinary hearings and investigations so as to deter them. We find the withdrawal of funding, which causes it, makes it impossible sometimes for uh, pro-Palestinian operations to continue. Um, we find people being denied a platform. Um, social media uh, companies removing people's access to websites or to TikTok or to Facebook, simply on the basis of accusations of anti-Semitism without any proof that there has been anti-Semitism or racist statements of that kind. We found um, banks being approached and urged and sometimes successfully to remove the banking facilities to pro-Palestinian groups so that they cannot collect money or transfer uh, charitable funds to, to Palestinian uh, uh, organizations in Israel. We find interference with free assembly on campuses, uh, student demonstrations um, uh, organized around the notion that Israel is apartheid an apartheid state being uh, denied assembly rights, denied the right to associate and to organize, and sometimes being even being denied access to the university, even when they got lectures to attend, because they've been involved in organizing something around Israel that accuses Israel of being an apartheid state, and that being, a, uh, being considered to be a, a sign of anti-Semitism. There are cyber attacks on individuals, um, and there have even been individual threats and intimidation to individuals who've been in act, acting in that way. All of this, or the vast majority of it, is built around the mobilization of the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance definition of anti-Semitism. Uh, now, if you haven't come across this, and many of you I suspect have, but for those of you who haven't, this is becoming one of the major weapons that is being used internationally. The International Holocaust Rumors Alliance definition is a strange fish. It's a fish that you wouldn't have expected to find floating about 
in any university campus water. Um, it consists of two parts. It's a 39 word definition, an extremely long definition you would have thought for a definition of racism. But one of the key things about this definition is its inadequacy. Anti-Semitism is a real problem. It's a problem in Britain, not amongst Palestinian advocates, but there is a real problem of, of anti-Semitism in Britain. The problem about this definition is that it fails to capture many of the forms of anti-Semitism that exist in Britain. It has been described by lawyers as so imprecise that it's completely unusable for legal or disciplinary purposes. Um, and it is so poorly framed that though not objectionable in itself, it is a complete diversion from the struggle against anti-Semitism or any other form of racism. On the other hand, in order to identify what the definition is supposed to capture, this so-called definition surprise, su supplies 11 what are called illustrative examples. No less than seven of these 11 illustrative examples relate to Israel. And four of those seven conflate anti-Semitism and criticism of Zionism explicitly. In other words, they conflate the political criticism of the Zionist project with the racism towards Jews that constitutes anti-Semitism. In other words, an intellectually incoherent uh, uh, position. There have in fact been two legal opinions from British Queen's counselors, and most of you won't know what a Queen's counselor is. It is a senior lawyer, somebody who could act as a judge, uh, a senior barrister or, or advocate in a court. And both of these legal opinions find that the, the IHRA definition has no legal standing, should not be used as if it does by institutions or universities. And it threatens, uh, because of the way that it works, the statutory duties of public bodies like universities to defend freedom of expression and assembly. And if it was used as it has been to ban lawful events by Palestinian advocates, that ban itself would be unlawful and the university would have been in breach of, of British law. Nevertheless, despite all of that, the immediate past uh, minister for higher education, a man called Gavin Williamson, tried unprecedentedly in, in British politics as government interference in the operation of universities to force this definition on universities, to force them to adopt it uh, by threats of financial consequences if they didn't, um, in order to drive through the campaign in defense of Israel and against Palestine. And, up, and to date, slightly over half of the 164 British universities have adopted it, and uh, slightly less than half have defied the minister and the next minister who is carrying on the same policy have defied that so far and have refused to adopt it on the basis that infringes their, um, uh, their integrity and their autonomy. Um, and the campaign over that definition is continuing. The, the very last thing I want to say, and, and to say it quickly, is that these are the campaigns and the nature of the campaigns that are being mounted against free expression and uh, academic freedom in British universities. The most important effect of which is the chilling effect causing students and academics to hold back, to self-censor over fear of, what, of the attack that's going to be mounted on them. But the response to it from our side, our uh, uh, effect on our attempt to knock it back, um, takes a number of different forms. Legal defense of targeted individuals, organized by um, a very effective organization for uh, the European Center uh, for Legal Defense, um, staff student mobilizations on campuses uh, to defend people, and then student or staff, or sometimes both, challenges to universities that have adopted the definition or are considering adopting it. And here I've got a piece of good news for you. And the good news is this, that in every single case where we, um, and I'm a member of the British Committee for the Universities of Palestine, um, where we have been involved with local trade lecturers trade unions to try to help them fight back against the IHRA definition in every single case that this has been raised by staff in their universities to urge their universities to rescind the decision to adopt this, this, this definition or not to adopt it if they're considering it in every single case so far we've won and caused those universities to abandon the adoption or to decide not to now that's not very many I think we managed it in 10 out of 
the, the 70 or 80 that so far have adopted it. But it's quite difficult to organize that, but it's an ongoing process. In other words, and I'll finish with this, the incoherence of the attack on academic freedom and freedom of expression, the incoherence of the defense of that attack is so profound that if the movement in opposition to these attacks can be mounted in the way that it has been mounted, it is always successful. The difficulty is making sure that the organization of that resistance is put in place, because when it is, um, we win. That's all. Thank you so much, Tom. Uh, very well put together, very well uh, presented. Um, I, I couldn't agree more with all of the things that you say. Yes, the, the IHRA definition is very problematic, and you said it was adopted by the British government, but it's also been adopted by the EU and the EU Commission. And while it is a non-binding definition, there are definitely efforts being made to, to make the definition binding and to, to impose um, uh, that definition on, on um, a number of different organizations and institutions. And uh, sadly, it is true. Sometimes just the fear of being accused of anti-Semitism uh, causes a self-censorship. And again, it supports where, where academics and, and human rights defenders feel they that they have to apply that balanced approach so that they can try to, to um, uh, negate or to try to protect themselves um, uh, from those accusations. Um, I do want to remind our guests and our participants on the lecture that if they have, they have questions and they would like to contribute to the conversation that they use uh, the chat um, and the Q&A. Uh, and we will be having a 30 minutes, hopefully a 30 minute Q&A uh, once we have heard from, from all of our speakers. Next, we will be hearing from uh, Rima Capitan, who is a US attorney that specializes in employment litigation, consulting and advocacy on behalf of employees and uh, particularly faculty. She has published and spoken on the ways in which academic freedom and advocacy for human rights intersect, including the academic boycotts implications for academic freedom. Rima, thank you for joining us and thank you for staying up so late. <laughs> Thank you so much. And I really think that events like this go a long way towards building the kind of international solidarity that combat these phenomena that Professor Hickey is talking about. So thank you. Um, so I'll briefly address three ways in which freedom of speech on Palestine is suppressed, and then highlight appro approaches that I think have been successful in combating that suppression, um, with a focus on developments in the United States, which I think is particularly appropriate since everyone in the United States is asleep right now. But hopefully it'll be, uh, this kind of comparative perspective will be useful. So I'll address, I'll start by addressing briefly direct suppression of speech in Palestine right now, just because there's a, an interesting recent relevant development. Um, of course, the Israeli government has long been focused on suppressing uh, academic freedom and academic speech within Palestine at Palestinian universities. Um, in the 1980s, it directly shut down entire universities and professors were required to teach underground. Um, since that time, it routinely prevents students and faculty from traveling. It censors educational materials. It conducts raids on universities. It sometimes bombs educational institutions. Um, but just this last week, um, the Israeli government, the defense ministry took an interesting move of limiting, uh, trying to isolate Palestinian universities. So it decided to, um, it's now going to decide on an individual basis which if foreign lecturers are permitted to teach in Palestinian universities and what topics they're permitted to teach. Um, so this is really a direct assault on academic freedom. Um, there are also restrictions on the number of foreign faculty who are going to be permitted entry uh, there are no more than 100 teaching visas permitted, no more than 150 foreign student visas, um, and then other arbitrary restrictions, and those restrictions against faculty from the Arab world are, are worse. And so this move is crucial to the suppression of the liberation movement for two reasons. Um, one of them is that it limits the ability of Palestinians to develop economically and to advocate for themselves. Um, it, it's just another restriction on Palestinian education and Palestinians have long been, um, have long put a lot of emphasis on education because they see it as central to the development of the society, of any society. And of course, it prevents free dialogue and cooperation between Palestinians and others around the world, particularly their international supporters. 
Uh, and there have been some effective international mobilizations to try to resist these types of moves. I think the most effective ones are when local Palestinians cooperate with those abroad um, to bring light to these types of issues and to resist them through pressure on the Israeli government. Um, in the United States, I'll, I'll start with a bit of a positive note or, or I guess um, transition to a positive note. And in the United States, the atmosphere in terms of suppression of speech on Palestine has been improving. It's a low bar, but um, it, it's now possible to advocate for Palestine in a way that it wasn't possible in the past. Um, and I think that resistance to the suppression of speech on Palestine has to be multi-pronged. And when it is, uh, because of the incoherence of the anti-Palestinian um, narrative as Professor Hickey described, uh, when there's multi-pronged coordinated resistance, it's often very effective. And in the United States, we've had gains even in, in government. So there are of course very uh, concerted efforts to make sure that the United States government can never do anything to even remotely challenge what Israel's doing. And to the contrary, the United States government is routinely pressured to, and does enable Israeli apartheid. Uh, but now, for the first time, there are uh, successful efforts by legislators in the U.S. to challenge that, um, that unquestioning support for Israel. And there have even been U.S. congresspersons openly uh, calling Israel an apartheid state and opposing Zionism itself as opposed to simply opposing isolated Israeli actions. And so that's a huge step. And uh, I think direct involvement in government is one of the um, the, the tactics uh, that Palestinian supporters should use. Um, there's a, a feeling that it's, it's, at least in the United States, that it's kind of a lost cause, uh, but that's not necessarily the case anymore. Um, so another way in which there's been an attempt to suppress speech on Palestine in the United States is exclusion from the workplace, uh, particularly in academia, just like in the UK. And oftentimes here, the charge is anti-Semitism, of course, on the legal front, the, uh, the definition of anti-Semitism, using anti-Semitism to uh, e equating it with Zionism, that approach has had limited legal traction. Um, but in 2019, President Trump did adopt the International Holocaust Remembrance definition and, um, and authorized ordered agencies to use that, for example, in investigating civil rights claims um, in the Department of Education. So it's, it's a dangerous phenomenon. And of course, even though it's had limited legal traction, the charge of anti-Semitism is a powerful one. And it's one that um, results in self-censorship as well as uh, harassment of student groups on campus, of, of faculty, et cetera. So uh, my area is employment law and I've come across many instances in which faculty members are uh, excluded from the academic setting on the basis of their advocacy for Palestine. And I'd say that in the last five, 10 years, um, partly because of the increasingly effective mobilization against suppression of speech here, uh, the cases in which uh, faculty members have been more successful in, def in defending against charges of anti-Semitism and in overcoming and in combating their exclusion from academia. Um, and just to, to mention a few examples. So uh, Professor Terry Ginsburg this is more than 10 years ago, was excluded from a university in North Carolina because of her advocacy for, because of her opposition to Zionism. She was found to be overqualified for her position, which is strange for academia. Um, uh, also, of course, Norman Finkelstein was, uh, was kicked out of the United States, essentially. I mean, he, he lost his job at DePaul. And um, so both of those cases, there was some support from the community, but um, ultimately, the, the exclusion of these faculty members was successful. More recently, there have been some successes. Most, the most famous one is the Stephen Salaita case, which you all know about, I'm sure, and Rabab Abdulhadi's case. And she's had a huge victory recently with the help of her union. And I'll mention one I was involved with also, uh, the case of Ayman Shahadeh here in Chicago. Um, one of his classes on the history of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict was canceled. And he uh, launched a grassroots movement to oppose that. Um, his case is a good, good example of a combination being used of a grassroots movement 
legal advocacy and union support. Union support is often crucial. Uh, and also when there isn't a union, faculty organizations, the support of faculty governance bodies such as faculty senates, senates or even simply um, petitioning and, and organizing by faculty that, that's not necessarily part of a faculty organization is extremely effective. And so in, in his case, he was able to get his class reinstated uh, without actually filing a lawsuit. The Illinois Associ Association for American University Professors supported him. And uh, I think it's, it's that support and publicity that helped. Um, in that case also, there was simply ignorance on the part of the university administration, I think, about uh, what its duties were because it was asking him to, or faulting him for not being balanced in his lecture. And it, it didn't really think about the case from an academic freedom perspective. So we can really help universities by reminding them that uh, faculty members have academic freedom to begin with. But this leads me to a third type of suppression of speech. And um, many of you are familiar with this, I'm sure. Uh, sometimes the principle of freedom of speech itself is deployed as a means of silencing freedom of speech on Palestine. Um, this happens often in the university setting. So uh, in response to faculty attempts to boycott Israel, uh, Zionists say that we're limiting the academic freedom of Israeli professors. And this rhetoric is incoherent for a number of reasons. One of them is that oftentimes the, the freedom of speech of Israeli professors isn't at issue at all. So uh, sometimes there's a conflict, often there's a conflict between conflicting rights and interests that courts and uh, others in society have to resolve. Uh, in the case of the boycott, there's the academic freedom of Israelis on one hand and the civil rights of Palestinians or the rights of academics to boycott on the other. And oftentimes there's no conflict at all. So um, the response to that charge that academic freedom is at stake in the academic boycott can often be that there is no entitlement by Israeli academics to um, associate or to participate in certain academic activities. So scholars in the United States and other places have the right to decide for themselves with whom to associate. There's a freedom of association, which United States courts have recognized. Um, for example, in the Roberts versus the United States Jaycees case, um, the court held that the freedom of association plainly presupposes freedom not to associate. And that's a quote from this 1984 opinion. Um, so there's a recognition that people have the right to decide for themselves with whom they're going to associate. And if, if, if for example, a university decides we're not going to form an academic partnership with some Israeli institution, it's within its rights to do so. And it's not suppression of speech. It's not suppression of the freedom of that Israeli institution to decline to participate in, in such a, an endeavor. Um, and then in other times when there is an apparent or actual uh, conflict of rights, uh, the, what the court sometimes does here is, uh, first of all, acknowledge all the constitutional rights at issue. And second, ask, is the proposed action the least restrictive means available to achieve the desired ends? And there have been cases when the court has held that the, the, the right to boycott is justified by uh, the fact that it's being deployed in order to protect important rights or freedoms. Um, in the case of NAACP versus Claiborne, the Supreme Court held that when Black citizens banded together and collectively expressed, quote, dissatisfaction with a social structure that had denied them rights to equal treatment and respect, the boycott clearly involved constitutional protected activity. And so the boycott was itself a form of speech that was worthy of protection. And that's often the case when it comes to the academic boycott of Israel as well. And I'll end on that note. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions and engage in further dialogue. Thank you. Thank you, Rima. Um, it's wonderful to hear that um, um, these individuals, these academic individuals, these professors are, 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 are successful in the courts. And also uh, what Tom also said that when, it, when there is a pushback against these allegations or supposed charges that they, that they fall apart. And I think that that's probably one of the key things to dissipate 
um, the, this atmosphere of intimidation, because as I said, what it does, what happens more often than not is that the, the, the threat of the intimidation is enough to, to self-censor. And I think that when people see that, the, that these allegations are, are false or have um, no foundations whatsoever, I think that will encourage, of course, uh, more people to get involved and to, to, to push back against um, these policies. Uh, we're going to hear now from, uh, one moment, please. Uh, and I hope I pronounced your name right, uh, Ramses uh, Karim Ramzi, who is a German Palestinian student uh, based in, and again, I apologize for the mispronunciation of the city, Sigan, near Cologne in Germany. Um, he has lost many family members uh, in the war in Gaza in 2014, among them his father and younger half-siblings, and he has become an active voice uh, for Palestine in Germany. Um, neither the cruel death of his father or any of the other Palestinian families holds German institutions and officials back in silencing Palestinian speech on Palestine, which in Germany extends into the major parts of the left. Uh, Ramses, if we could hear from you. Yeah, thank you. Um, can you hear me? Absolutely. Welcome. Great. Awesome. Uh, thank you for the introduction and also um, thank you again for the invitation. Um, I think when we are talking about Germany, there's one thing I need to make clear in the beginning. The German context is um, one of the most uh, difficult um, national contexts um, to be active on Palestine. And I am pretty sure actually that international activists who have been active in the German context would fully agree with me on this. Um, it is a uniquely repressive situation already in implemented for a long time and for many years. Um, I want to focus on four uh, levels of um, repression and oppression of the freedom of speech on Palestine and Germany. First, um, the government and the um, political level. Um, second, the media and the cultural um, level. Third, um, the academic university context and so on. on and um, fourth, uh, NGOs and civil uh, society. So first of all, um, the government uh, or the political superstructure. Um, the German government um, does not want to draw universal truths um, and an international ideal from the darkest chapters of uh, German history. Um, but still, it uses um, this history in order to legitimize um, these actions. It is not about condemning and struggling against any form of oppression, racism, and genocide uh, due to the Nazi atrocities. Um, but it is about making the state of Israel its own reason of state, meaning um, the ideological core of what Ger Germany stands for. Um, so German support for the state of Israel is not the fight against anti-Semitism, which is still a relevant um, a form of oppression and racism in uh, Germany, but it serves as an um, ideological legitimization for new German nationalism, which um, aims to become a respected world power again. And of course, Germany has problems due to its past um, to, to sell this. Um, to the world. Um, so due to the First and Second World War, the reputation of German imperialism suffered a lot, obviously. Um, and the support of the state of Israel uh, is a central element for Germany in order to whitewash itself um, from uh, the Nazi atrocities and the industrialized uh, genocide against the European Jews. Um, so to make the supposedly clearest cut, um, the German government um, often uh, equates Zionism, the state of Israel, and Jews as one, which is anti-Semitic by nature too, um, but, but it uh, uh, uses that as um, the weaponization of um, anti-Semitism and calls anyone anti-Semitic who resists against this concept, um, which it calls um, its, its reason of state, basically. And of course, um, anti-Semitism, therefore, is also a very severe accusation in Germany, uh, where many, many people have lost uh, their jobs. I can um, give you a few examples when I come to the other levels. Um, so the BDS um, resolution in, in Germany, you might have heard of, I don't know, but um, it is the only such um, resolution um, worldwide. Um, it, uh, it equates um, BDS to the Nazi campaign 
against uh, German Jews and their stores and so on. Uh, Kauft nicht beim Juden, don't buy from the Jew, which was um, a racist Nazi um, campaign um, to exclude um, Jews uh, from society in the 30s. Um, so this um, resolution um, works to uh, delig delegitimize and criminalize the BDS movement in Germany, which is very small uh, anyways, um, but it's not getting any public rooms for events uh, and anyone being connected to BDS or allegedly being connected to it um, in a McCarthyist uh, manner will, um, will uh, be excluded um, from any, any event or uh, room in Germany. Um, I can also give examples on that in the com coming elements. Um, even though even the federal court of Germany ruled that uh, the anti-BDS policy is um, illegal and against German law, and this BDS resolution is also illegal and against German law, but in practice it is still um, implemented. Um, even though where it is implemented and where BDS activists are um, being forbidden any public rooms and so on, um, when they uh, go to court, they basically win every single case because um, it is not um, uh, possible to legitimize it on the base of um, German law, actually, what is happening there, because it's a huge um, uh, attack on freedom of speech. So when we come to media and culture, um, the, the most recent example was that many um, Deutsche Welle, uh, which is a, a inter, um, German uh, outlet um, working together with uh, international um, offices, um, where many um, workers lost their jobs due to the accusation of anti-Semitism because they um, were critical of Israel, um, mostly Arab um, uh, journalists. Mm. And um, the biggest newspaper in Germany uh, is the Bild uh, 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 newspaper, which is comparable to The Sun, for example, in England. Um, and it has the highest uh, print rate and um, yeah, is widely read. Um, its publisher um, says of himself, he's a German Zionist. Um, and those working as journalists um, have to sign um, that they will support this uh, German reason of stage, uh, state. So um, uh, supporting the state of Israel in everything they write. Otherwise um, they can just be kicked out. Um, and culture excluding anyone connected to BDS, of course, doesn't only affect people in Germany. Um, and it went so far that a letter by the biggest cultural organizations in Germany um, had to criticize its repression um, against freedom of speech on Palestine because they couldn't invite basically any progressive liberal <laughs> leftist um, from other um, uh, uh, countries because um, there, there was some connection to a pro-Palestinian stance or solidarity, or they have been to a, an event where there was someone. So um, uh, if you can imagine. Um, and Palestinian groups um, are uh, racially profiled before cultural events. So um, uh, for example, in Bonn, there was a case where they had to denounce BDS or they um, will uh, uh, openly and publicly, or they uh, will be excluded um, from an intercultural exchange and International Culture Day, only because they were a Palestinian group. Um, they had to denounce it to be part of um, this so-called intercultural exchange. And um, even, even well-known and respected post-colonial post thinkers like um, Achille Mbembe, and so on are labeled as um, severe anti-Semites in Germany and disinvited, no matter on what uh, topics they are talking. Uh, and there was a huge uh, media campaign afterwards against um, such uh, such academics. Um, so you have have it in culture and media. You also have it in um, NGOs and civil society. Um, the Amnesty International report on um, the state of uh, apartheid, um, which uh, Israel is um, committing, uh, was <laughs> supported by every um, regional group except for the German group. Um, the German group said it won't do any actions on that, this because of the special German context and so on, and it could lead to anti-Semitism 
Um, the same is true for um, the climate movement, uh, Fridays for Future. The German um, group was the only one uh, which didn't want to um, be part of a pro-Palestinian statement. And um, there was a, a, a small um, uh, exclaimer, uh, the German group uh, does not support this uh, for a global statement uh, from the Fridays for Future uh, movement in support of Palestine. Um, and even within the left, uh, most either exclude Palestine from their activism or even aggressively support Zionism, even in the radical left, if you can imagine. So um, they are like uh, <laughs> um, masked um, radical leftists with Israeli flags um, th uh, that call themselves anti-Germans, but support this um, uh, German uh, national reason of state in Germany. So you have it. Uh, you have a picture where um, Palestine, Palestine and Palestinian voices are excluded um, out of basically every corner in Germany. Uh, and therefore, there are extra groups for Palestinian leftists like uh, Palestine Speaks because they can't organize in um, even within the German so-called internationalist left most of the time. And this is a symptom, of course, of this uh, widespread anti-Palestinian sentiment in uh, uh, German civil society and even the left. Um, when it comes to universities, academics are losing their jobs for many, many years already. Um, when they are um, talking about uh, um, Israel committing apartheid or um, being somehow connected to settler colonialism and so on. And there's also a McCarthyism. If you are um, um, uh, talking to them or working with them, there's a climate of uh, a, lot, uh, a lot of fear um, being connected to some, some kind of uh, pro-Palestinian activism or pro-Palestinian position. Uh, this is not only true for the academics and the institutional level, but also for the student uh, associations. Um, for example, the Greens or the Social um, Democrats, they are also fighting any attempts um, uh, of talking on um, about Palestine or even having a discussion with um, even pro-Zionist and pro-Palestinian uh, panelists, uh, they would prevent anything like that. Uh, of course, also um, drawing um, from the uh, IHRA definition or the 3D test on anti-Semitism by Nathan Sharansky. Um, and in June, 2019, um, a month after this, um, this uh, government resolution on BDS I talked about, German student groups um, consisting really of uh, broad political uh, uh, factions, uh, such as the Green Party, the Social Democrats, uh, and Angela Merkel's uh, Christian Democrats, um, came together and passed their own uh, resolution condemning the BDS movement and stating that they would not engage in any sort of cooperation with BDS supporters. Um, the resolution co also called BDS a uh, particularly aggressive expression of anti-Semitism for which there are, uh, can be no room, rooms at German universities. And, and uh, this is the same country where the, there are still right-wing uh, terror attacks against um, Jews and where um, more than 90% uh, of um, anti-Semitic uh, hate crimes uh, come from the right, not from uh, pro-Palestinian activists or Palestinians. Um, or BDS activists. Um, and this year also saw the um, um, saw the anti BDS vote that uh, froze out uh, students wearing kofias and also in cultural events um, by the German left. There's often um, you can't can't get in if you are wearing a kofia um, because it is uh, yeah it is um, deemed anti-Semitic. So we really do not need an active Israel lobby similar to other Western countries, because many Germans in the institutions are willing to, um, to defend Israel very aggressively on um, their own conviction for free, so to say. So compared to the United States, we are currently still are in this lost cause uh, feeling here in Germany, to be honest, but also like in the United States, it does not have to be hopeless forever. Um, statistics actually show that German public opinion of Israel develops in a more and more negative way, um, especially since May. And um, it is still not comparable to other Western countries, um, but since May, there has also been a shift here in Germany. And this um, uh, media, political, uh, cultural, institutional level and so on does not um, speak for, for every German who has a, has a right gut feelings uh, uh, gut feeling that there's something wrong and there's a clear oppression 
uh, going on where um, um, a fully armed state is uh, terrorizing a stateless um, a civil society like the Palestinians. Um, so to, to have a, a conclusion, my main thesis is, I would say, um, that other countries um, and their right-wing tendencies within the left, like the Blairites, for example, and the Labour Party and so on, are learning from and importing um, these instruments of the weaponization of anti-Semitism that have been implemented and tested in Germany for many, many decades already and um, have, have proven as be, being very effective. Of course, we always thought it is very effectively um, in, in the German context where you had the Nazi regime and the, um, the most horrible um, uh, outcome anti-Semitism could take. Um, but we now see that it also works um, for um, other uh, national situations and is being used. Um, so I think our task is um, that we have to strengthen our connection to so support and inform each other on, um, on, on how this is uh, being implemented and happening on the ground, actually. Firstly, of course, Germany shows how bad it, it can actually get uh, regarding suppress uh, suppressing freedom of speech on Palestine. But secondly, of course, Germany cannot stay an isolated island when it comes to Palestine. It is being influenced by all these um, developments and um, you see, especially see it on a cultural level at the moment. Um, and I think if we want to uh, go, go for this aim and strengthen our connection um, on an international level, events like these are um, an, a very important step um, in this direction. Thank you. Thank you, Ramses, for that uh, presentation. Um, I, I think that um, I like the way you broke it up with the government, political, media, cultural, academic, and civil society. I definitely think that those four levels can apply to any country. And of course, we recognize the, the special situation due to the historical um, uh, perspective or the historical, um, the history of, of Germany and so on and so forth. Um, I, I do want to say that um, the BDS resolution, much like the IHRA definition is also non-binding. Um, so it's not something that's actually a legal um, uh, mechanism. Uh, but it is being used much in the same way as the IHRA definition is being used, and that's to create that, that intimidation and so on and so forth. Um, we at Badil, of course, um, are funded by um, non-governmental institutions, um, international NGOs, non-government organizations who are often funded by ministries of foreign affairs of their countries. So, for example, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Germany funds a German NGO, which will fund a Palestinian NGO. And how that has trickled down into our civil society is that the German organizations will not fund Palestinian organizations who are supporting boycott, divestment, and sanctions, for example. So yes, it definitely has um, a significant impact on, on, on resources and so on and so forth. Um, I will now open the floor for questions, and I do believe that we have um, a number of questions in the, um, the Q&A. Uh, Steve is asking, um, uh, yes, there is a question there. Steve uh, Little is saying, um, critical thinking is clear. If you have three differing definitions of Semitism, Jewishness, Israeliness, anyone can push back against accusations of anti-Semitism by dismissing the two flexible or wrongly applied definitions. Why is there no political campaign to dismiss the IHRA and demand it be withdrawn? Um, perhaps uh, we'll give this one over to Tom uh, to start with. Yes, I, well, there is a political campaign. There's a political campaign in civil society mm -hmm. um, and that, that campaign, uh, has been successful in, as I said, in winning the argument in, in universities and in a, a small number of other organizations. But of course, that's not the same thing as a political campaign that will alter government policy. Uh, the, the government in uh, the UK, for example, using the UK as an example, as an ally of Israel, the current conservative government as an ally of Israel, um, is committed to supporting the IHRA definition. Uh, it, it wants to do so. It, it, the, the, 
the campaign against the Irish IRA definition would have to be about a change in government if you wanted to change government policy. And yet that is another difficulty, because whereas the British Labour Party once was um, uh, under Jeremy Corbyn for a short time anti-Zionist, it hadn't been anti-Zionist before that, but for a short time under Jeremy Corbyn, the majority of, of the party was anti-Zionist and was opposed to the IHRA definition. The campaign of the Israel lobby um, in Britain, using the IHRA definition and using influence in other places, was instrumental in breaking Jeremy Corbyn's leadership and causing the Labour Party under his leadership to lose the last election. Now we have a leader of the Labour Party in uh, an ex-Attorney General, the Law Lord, Sir Keir Starmer, leading the Labour Party, who is a convinced and proud Zionist, supports the IHRA definition, and will expel from the Labour Party anybody who stands up and says that Israel is an apartheid state. So it's very difficult in Britain's British circumstances. The two main political parties, and it is a largely two-party political system in Britain, are both now Zionist organisations. If you want to oppose the IHRA on a general political level, you have to be in favour of some kind of social transformation. You have to be a member of the Socialist Workers' Party or a member of uh, some kind of radical organisation. Um, or, or the Green Party, but even the Green Party's leadership um, uh, is uh, not exactly um, wholeheartedly criti critical of Zionism in Britain. So it's the, in terms of general political opposition to the IHRA, it's very difficult. But on the ground, amongst trade unionists, amongst staff, amongst students in campuses, it is possible to have uh, to win those political arguments as has been done. Thank you, Tom. Uh, Rima and uh, Ramses, do, would you like to add anything there? Go ahead, Ramses. Thank you. Um, I'd, like, I'd like to add one um, form of intervention, and this is also um, uh, opposing the H uh, IHRA definition by other definitions on anti-Semitism. And there's an example of the um, JDA, the Jerusalem Decla Declaration on anti-Semitism. Um, I think I think this is important that we have other definitions, even though also the J JDA basically centralizes um, the question of Israel um, as uh, being connected to the question of anti-Semitism. Um, and I think it is very important that we um, uh, define anti-Semitism as um, uh, racism against Jews, um, which does not necessarily have a connection to the state of Israel. Even anti-Semites who say they hate the Jews due to Israel, uh, anti-Semites who just <laughs> need a legitimization um, for their hatred against Jews. And um, I think we wouldn't say this in other cases of um, racism or is is Islamophobia when it comes to um, uh, racists legitimizing the hatred of um, Muslims um, by um, the state of Turkey or uh, Saudi Arabia um, as uh, um, anti-Muslim um, uh, uh, bigotry uh, focused on Turkey or focused on uh, Saudi Arabia, but we are doing the, uh, this uh, the, exactly this um, thing when it comes to Israel. Um, and I, I think we need to step back from that and have a clearer um, definition of what anti-Semitism actually is. I think this is uh, one of the most um, important um, interventions we can uh, take. And I'll just add to that, that of course, in the United States, both of the two major parties are also very much Zionists and you know, vociferous supporters of Israel, but I don't think overthrow of the entire system is necessary really to um, make some ground in opposing the equation of Zionism and anti-Semitism, I mean, anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism. Um, I think the most effective way to do it in terms of rhetoric is appeal to universal principles like freedom of speech. Um, and so, uh, sometimes with concerted effort, even Zionist lawmakers can be convinced to reverse course on these types of issues if you base your argument on freedom of speech. Thank you. Um, the next question is from Leila. Uh, she says that the international community often referred to, often refers to communities in the US and Europe. How can we ensure that the global South does and can have a huge voice when it comes to BDS or fighting for the Palestinian cause? especially students across the global south need to work to network actively with the Palestinian cause with university based organizations advocating for liberation in Palestine. How do they do this? 
Anyone want to jump in? No? Um, if I un go ahead, Bima. Well, I was just going to say, I, I think by strengthening uh, communication through international solidarity. So um, I think engaging in BDS activities is a powerful tool and joining the international movement for boycott, divestment and sanctions. Um, the Global South is a crucial component of that. It has to be an international effort and um, sharing strategies, reaching out to uh, activists in other countries, um, engaging in internal discussions about uh, on campus and other places about BDS. Um, I will also jump in and say that I think it's crucial for us to um, um, connect the Palestinian struggle with other social justice struggles happening around the world. And I think that when we when we have done this in the past, and I think we, we need to do it more effectively, how to connect um, uh, the struggles that are happening in uh, the global south with things that Western states, particularly the United States and Europe, or um, persons who are fighting for freedoms and uh, human rights in those areas can understand. Because oftentimes, it, because the narrative is so muddled, because Israel is so effective and has so many resources and is staging a um, battle on all fronts, uh, like Ramsi said, I mean, it's happening in the government at the political level, it's happening within the media and the cultural level, it's happening at the academic level, and it's even happening in civil society. I think that we need to be, to be able to, to uh, connect more as well. Um, and. Um, create those associations or create those interconnections with other social justice struggles. Uh, Layla has another question. How do British universities link? Oh, I'm sorry. Did anyone else want to jump in on that, Tom? Or I think Tom uh, wanted to speak. Okay. Apologies. Go ahead, Tom. No, uh, I, I just wanted to respond to that um, in, in, in two ways, really. Uh, f first of all, um, I really wanted to agree with what you, what you just said, Herbert. Um, I think it's really important that the, that the link between the Palestinian struggle and local struggles in the South uh, be emphasized. One of the things that I argue with um, Palestinian colleagues in the UK is that in order to carry the argument, they have to not just be engaged in, say, trade union activity or local campaigns in, in communities, they have to be the best fighters. They have to put themselves forward as the most militant fighters over the wages and conditions issues in, in, in trade unions or, or, or whatever. And that creates the basis on which uh, people will take much more to heart uh, the situation in Palestine. The other thing is that one of, what I find is that one of the most important recruiters to the Palestine cause is if somebody can actually go and visit Palestine and witness for themselves what life for the Palestinians is like. Now, for the vast majority of people in the Global South, that will be impossible. But what comes close to it is if, instead of just organizing solidarity meetings with Palestine and having a discussion about it, if you can always try, wherever possible, to get a Palestinian speaker to speak about their experience, about what their personal experience is like in, in, of having to live there under occupation or under conditions of discrimination if they're in is, is Palestinians who are Israeli citizens or if they're under bombardment in, 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 in Gaza. So uh, having that direct contact with, with Palestine and Palestinians, I think, is, is important. And the last thing is, I think is, I think, um, you know, in a global world of such interconnectedness because of social media, uh, uh, beca because of the mass media and the way that it works, I think often we can be surprised by how widespread is knowledge of what's going on. Um, as, as we've been told about the German situation, even if governments, political parties, companies, etc., are committed because of the anti-BDS re uh, resolution to have regulations that attempt to wipe Palestine off the map of consciousness as far as they're concerned, um, as we were told, uh, nevertheless, despite that, amongst the population, even if it's a minority current, there is a growing awareness of the nature of uh, Israeli colonization and settlement and what that means, and therefore a growing, at least anxiety, if not antipathy, towards Israel. And I think that in the global south, that will be the case too. 
It's a question of finding those people or creating, creating the moment where people with those sentiments can think, ah, I want to go to that. I want to be part of that. I want to identify with this or this is part of my life too. Thank you, Tom. Um, Leila is asking how do British universities link with other universities in the South to increase the advocacy work on the Palestinian question? And I will ask that uh, we be brief because we have maybe seven minutes, if I'm not mistaken, Ranjan, for the rest of the, the webinar. Who would, who would like to take on that, that question? Tom, perhaps? <laughs> Sorry, it's me again. I didn't. Um, Look, I, I think uh, in, in a variety of different ways. I mean, but but not in a in a tightly organised fashion. It has to be said that um, in the Palestine Solidarity Movement in Britain, um, we are not remotely as belaboured as colleagues in Germany in the Solidarity Movement are, and the situation in Britain isn't quite um, is both in some senses worse and in some senses less bad than it is in the United States for Palestinian advocacy. But nevertheless, we are so belaboured over fighting our corner in Britain that uh, our attention to developing inter-institutional links um, has gone by the board. I mean, we, we don't do it effectively. Um, uh, those of us who have the capacity uh, to make those connections with, co with colleagues in the Global South, for instance, um, such as myself, um, I'd, Occasionally, because I have contacts in Kerala, for instance, in, in India, I have good friends there, um, I have that connection, but uh, and uh, have spoken in, in various meetings in, in Kerala about BDS and about, and about Israel. But it's not done systematically because we are so overwhelmed by fighting um, our corner in Britain and trying to defend the movement in Britain. That's something for us to, to start thinking about. So thank you very much for the question. It's, it's provoked uh, me to think about how we might do that. Last question here, and it's for uh, Ramses, I think. Um, how does a young activist like you working in Germany, given so many restrictive measures to work on BDS especially, what is uh, your advice to those still trying to work for BDS in other countries? Yeah, I think my advice would be very much connected to what um, Tom just explained. Um, it's very important to connect the Palestinian issue to other social justice um, issues. And that's also how I, especially as a young activist, um, ha has, have been doing it for a long time now. Um, I was very active also in the climate movement. Um, and uh, of course, because I, I was an active member in this case uh, locally, um, I couldn't be excluded from many others because they relied um, on, on me and other activists, uh, even though they knew. I am a supporter of uh, BDS, I am a supporter of the Palestinian struggle and very much unapologetically so. Um, so, so that's also a way. Um, and uh, what was for the German case especially important was um, the anti-racist movement, the Black Lives Matter movement internationally, which really um, helped us a lot. Uh, it also um, in, in Germany developed a, a consciousness on uh, racism and there were um, groups uh, spreading uh, like migrant um, self-organizations, I would call them, um, where you have um, young activists um, who are dealing uh, with uh, racism on a daily basis, um, uh, also organizing themselves and um, attacking this, um, this um, German um, state when it comes to the question of Israel. Um, and, and this influenced um, uh, our um, opportunities a lot, even though when it comes to BDS, um, BDS is helpful when it comes to the German context, um, but on another level, um, the international BDS movement um, is, is the main <laughs> um, thing um, affecting uh, German discourse, also in uh, culture. Um, uh, I think Barute uh, also said that, uh, you know, um, Omar uh, Barute, um, like, like one of the main figures of um, the BDS movement, that Germany is a lost cause when it comes to BDS. Um, and, and he's partly right. But uh, Germany and the German discourse is influenced by what's going on in, in the rest of the world. So if we have um, cultural um, progressive <clears throat> events in Berlin, of course, we are also inviting other artists and then they have, um, for example, in Berlin, they had a, a culture festival where the, um, the Israeli embassy was a sponsor. Um, 
and therefore it was a it was a target um, of BDS activism, and like ten um, or more uh, artists um, boycotted the event. N none of them German, of course, but still it uh, had its effect. Um, and and this is what's happening. And also the letter I was referring to in the cultural um, uh, sphere, which also uh, Ulrich in the in the comment section in the chat, if you can check it, um, gave a link on. Um, the Plädoyer der Initiative GG53 Weltoffenheit, which is like, okay, we are um, for, for openness when it comes to the world, and this is uh, um, our um, aim. This was this initiative by many cultural institutions in Germany. It was also a reaction on this BDS activism. So what's happening around the world um, is affecting uh, German discourse and Germany cannot stay an isolated island. That's what uh, makes our international connections and what uh, Rima said on uh, the connection and um, uh, communication so important because um, uh, it's all interconnected. Great, thank you so much. And I'd like to thank each and every one of our speakers for joining us today, Rima, Tom, Ramzis, for all your uh, wonderful presentations and insightful um, contributions to the discussion. I will leave the, uh, would like to say one more thing before we close off, and I know we're going over time a little bit. Um, I would like to uh, pick up something that one of the speakers said, I'm not sure exactly which one it is, but basically, um, uh, I believe Ramsey said it and also Rima said it, that if we look at civil society, international civil society, if we look at the unions, the academic, uh, the academic sector, um, um, and, and even private sector, there is a growing awareness and um, uh, a swing in the pendulum, let's say, in terms of uh, Palestine and changes of perception and not accepting the uh, traditional Palestinian, uh, the traditional uh, Zionist Israeli colonial apartheid narrative. So we are seeing um, changes even happening in German civil society as well as um, US civil society, where there is a growing support for Palestine and their rights and their struggle for liberation. However, as always, and this is historically proven, there is a, a gap between um, uh, public political will, public will, or the will of civil society, the will of the people, what the people want, and what is happening in the governments. And the closer um, or the more that we can shrink this gap between what uh, the people want and what the governments are doing, I think this is, of course, the closer we will get to achieving uh, a situation that not only includes liberation for Palestine, but also an expansion of freedoms for other peoples as well. Um, thank you so much, everyone, once again. Uh, thank you to MLN and our colleagues at MLN for putting this together. And thank you once again for our speakers. And we hope that you will join us next time uh, for our next webinar. And I'm not sure exactly what it is, Ron John, or if you want to put in a plug for the next webinar or if that's uh, for later. But thank you, everyone. The next webinar will be on liberation. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Can I just say one thing, uh, Lubna? Absolutely. One thing. You know, uh, from Asia, we are organizing an uh, Asia Pacific uh, seminar on at the end of April on embracing solidarities, very much uh, in line with what we have been talking. You know, bringing together oppressed groups in Asia to talk about their struggles and relating it to the struggle in Palestine so that you can create this unity of the oppressed because the oppressed understand oppression better than anybody else because they it, it's the same story it's a different location very often but uh, so this is one thing that we're doing and i think the other thing that we're doing which is important is also trying to bring afro-asian solidarity on palestine uh, again bringing oppressed groups to to talk with each other and the palestinians to see how we can all come together. I think this is an important thing and it relates so much to what you're saying about the need for civil society to close their gap and then bring pressure on the government because the government represents power. Power does not part with power voluntarily. It does so only under pressure. So we've got to see that happening. That's all I have to say, thank you. Absolutely, and that's a fabulous end to our webinar. I uh, hope to see you all again soon at the next webinar or in person, inshallah. Inshallah. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye, everybody, and thank you. Thank you.